Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Eversoll, the Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar series today. We have Wolfram Vekwet with us uh, from the University of Vienna, who will be talking with us about panomics. But before we go and hear his presentation, I'll give you a quick overview of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, or the IWGSC. So we are a, an international nonprofit. We have uh, members in uh, 71 countries and have more than 3,300 members. We have 10 sponsors, which includes uh, governmental entities as well as industry uh, and small um, organizations, uh, research organizations. Uh, in total, we have 914 institutes and companies that are somehow engaged with the IWGSC. The webinar, as well as all of our activities, are made possible by our very generous sponsors who allow us to do uh, coordination activities uh, globally, as well as this webinar series. So our vision, uh, after we published the reference sequence of the bread wheat genome in 2018, is to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. So there's a lot of different aspects that go into that, and it's really building these foundations to support breeding. So our next webinar uh, will be uh, later this year, and it will be on uh, wild relatives diversity for wheat breeding. Uh, so I would, you can already sign up for that webinar, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you on at, at that time. Um, just a quick note about the dashboard. Um, you can post questions in the questions panel. Please use that as that that, that is monitored by, by me, so I will see the, the questions. If you uh, need to reach one of us or the organizers, you can do that in the chat and then also monitor the chat because links to some of the presentations <laughs> that will be mentioned by Wolfram today will be listed uh, and you can copy those links and and have them. You can already download the handouts uh, from the presentation in the handout panel. And just a reminder that the webinar is recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. You can subscribe to the channel so that you never miss an upload. So without further ado, uh, I would again like to uh, welcome Wolfram Beckfoot who will give us a talk on panomics meets germplasm, understanding and exploiting intraspecific crop plant variation. Thank you for joining us, Wolfram. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, I have to activate now the right now. Thanks a lot, Kelly, for the kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me um, uh, to see, uh, to, to, to give a, a talk here in, in your seminar. Um, can you see my presentation? Uh, not yet. So ah, okay, just a second. We, now, can you see it now? Yes, we can. Ah, great, great. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's really a great pleasure, and I'm looking forward also to discuss all these issues later on. So it's about crops in a changing climate, and um, uh, today I would like to focus a bit on intraspecific crop plant variation, but also basic uh, uh, research questions in ecology and evolution, and I will address this a bit in the talk today. So, um, well, the basis for all our thoughts in this direction is net primary production photosynthesis of higher plants, and they provide the perfect balance on Earth. So uh, plants are the ultimate partners of human and all other uh, creatures on, on, on Earth because of the CO2 fixation, providing uh, net primary production for us as the primary consumers, and this is a perfect balance. However, we introduced uh, uh, perturbations into the system by releasing fossil fuels and CO2 into the atmosphere. So we're really disturbing the system and we see increasing CO2 levels, rising temperatures, 
And altogether, this has implications for global climate, food security, renewable resources, and so forth, right? And I think this uh, is, a, is a dramatic development, which is at the moment still underestimated, in my opinion. So there, there in 2020, we already had the uh, hottest year since 1850. And uh, of course, all the projections uh, point to a dramatic change in, uh, um, in, plan, uh, in human populations, uh, in, in a challenge in plant productivity, and also the challenge of immigration from development, uh, developmental countries. And this has all to be uh, buffered by, by our actions. So pressures on agriculture are enormous. So these are uh, climate change, loss of biodiversity, land degradation, water scarcity, but also population increase, uh, increase, change in consumption pattern, urbanization, economic growth. And this is um, uh, an, an, an not yet we can estimate the consequences of all these developments. And I think really the climate change will uh, dramatically um, uh, force this developments very much. And I try to, to cope with these issues it was in a research framework and scientific research framework when I pointed this uh, term green systems biology in 2011. And this com uh, some combines uh, genomic technology, so systems biology technologies like proteome metabolomics modeling with classical um, uh, research topics from ecology and evolution with respect to natural genetic variation biodiversity and adaptation, and the aim is to learn about these topics to, uh, to address biotechnolo biotechnology also and to uh, develop a sustainable system in this direction. So everything started um, when we uh, worked in, um, in, in Potsdam and Goimetz and Max Planck Institute, and based on our observations, we developed a genotype-phenotype equation in this systems biology framework. I will give you, give you a, a short introduction to this. So uh, 20 years ago, when we started to build up the metabolomics platforms at the Max Planck Institute in Potsdam, uh, we measured uh, uh, metabolites, hundreds of metabolites in different plant genotypes under different conditions and so forth. And we observed by doing some classical multivariate statistics, we observed strong correlations between the metabolites. Um, this uh, translated directly into so-called metabolic networks. And what we uh, recognized is that the genotypes, different genotypes, different conditions, had different structures of these metabolic networks based on correlation network analysis. And this uh, has lots of implications, of course, um, uh, with respect to network topology. But more important, we developed a stochastic model of metabolism, which led then to a genotype-phenotype equation. Um, I give you some mathematical background here. I don't want that you fully understand everything, but that you get an idea of what, what we did. And I'm totally happy to discuss this then later on. So we started with a metabolic network reconstruction of the photosynthetic pathway, Calvin cycle sucrose biosynthesis. And because we had seen this kind of fluctuation in the data, we introduced a fluctuation by so-called stochastic differential equations. You can see this indeed uh, also in nature. If you if you monitor a leaf surface and look for non-photochemical quenching uh, or photosynthetic activity, you see really a stochastic fluctuation of this activity uh, running over the leaf surface. So this is indeed a real situation which we simulated as a computer. We found very similar correlation networks, and more important, this was everything was. Um, uh, described by a mathematical equation, the so-called Lyapunov equation. This is going back to a Russian mathematician in the 19th century who developed these equations for the analysis of, of dynamic nonlinear systems. And in control series, this is used in, uh, till nowadays in engineering and so forth. I will give you more comments on this. So what this equation combines is on the one hand, the covariance, C is the covariance of the data. On the other hand, the Jacobian, which is a controlling uh, uh, regulatory matrix of the, of the system. So what are the, uh, the um, numbers or the, what is the content of the Jacobian? It's a linearization of the system at a steady state. And it's a, the entries are changes in reaction rates to changes in metabolite concentrations. And, if you know these entries of the Jacobian, you know the perturbation of the metabolic network. For instance, if you 
change ATP concentrations in this phosphorylation reaction in the Calvin cycle, then you would perturb the whole enzymatic reaction. You change the reaction rate, and this would give a changed entry in the Jacobian. In other words, now we are able to use the covariance uh, data from the metabolomics data, for instance, to calculate back the Jacobian. Another aspect is very important, and this now um, led to the idea that this is indeed a genotype-phenotype equation. So the Jacobian, the structure of the Jacobian matrix depends on the genome sequence. Um, what does this mean now? So when you have a fully sequenced genome, and you do a metabolic reconstruction, you look for autologous genes. You can find thousands of genes within this genome, and they constitute metabolic networks. And from these metabolic networks, actually, you can design a stoichiometric matrix, an interaction matrix, how metabolites are interacting by enzymatic reactions. And this gives you a, a static metabolic network. Um, which is indeed it's static information. It does not cover any dynamic information in contrast to the correlation network. Uh, but however, it gives you the underlying uh, connectivity of the metabolic network. And this is indeed part of the equation. So the stoichiometric matrix directly related or generated from the genome sequence is part of the Jacobian. So this is indeed a genotype phenotype equation, which we observe here. So the covariance matrix covers the dynamic part, the dynamics of the system at the various trajectories through the, uh, uh, through the different conditions and different genotypes. And the Jacobian uh, covers the metabolic regulation of the network. And the D matrix is the stochastic diffusion matrix. And this equation um, is uh, um, integrating all these aspects of multi-omics analysis nowadays. Uh, with data matrices, uh, using these data for multivariate statistics, and using having all these genome sequences available, and also these system theoretical um, equations, which we don't know because we don't know all the in vivo parameters of the system. I explained this more in three recent publications, if you are interested more into this framework. And this equation now combines all our um, approaches. So we start with uh, newly sequenced genomes on these species. We work on them. We do a metabolic regulatory reconstruction. We uh, then perform analysis of these um, organisms in by environmental perturbation. We measure all these data like metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, morphology, and integrate this into a data matrix. This, is a, this constitutes a covariance matrix. And uh, this feeds back then to a um, data-driven model of the system, which gives us an uh, idea of function interpretation and prediction of the system. Interestingly, this equation was also used in ecology in the 70s on population dynamics by um, Richard Levine and Bob May, a very famous ecologist. And they um, used a community matrix of prey and predator, for instance, instead of a Jacobi, it's the same, but they just called it differently. And uh, Bob May used the same equation, also the Lyapunov equation, and um, get some hypothesis from this data. Increasing diversity destabilizes the ecosystem measured by the eigenvalues. But he used random structures of the Jacobian, of the community matrix. In contrast to us, now we use really genome sequences, which gives us a clear structure of the Jacobian. And if I go further, this equation is also central to um, artificial intelligence and bio-inspired control theory nowadays. This is a classical um, multiple input, multiple output model of engineering. Um, so you can imagine any complex nonlinear system which you want, which you want to control. It could be a car, a, a rocket, a robot, but it could be also a biological system, a plant, a human or so. You have sensors where you measure um, all output variables, um, and these are then analyzed by a controller system, and the controller system generates then an input vector. This could be nutrition to stabilize uh, metabolic homeostasis, or in plants it could stabilize, uh, or it could be uh, light or, for, um, uh, or nutrition uh, fertilization to stabilize the system here. And we are exploring this system now in more detail to uh, apply this equation in this in direction. We implemented this in uh, a toolbox covain for data integration and data mining. 
And we have now automated this process by, uh, by a recent study by Zhang Li. He automated the metabolic reconstruction from a full genome sequence to reduce the network and adapt this to the measured uh, metabolite proteins transcript, so the state variables which we can measure actually. And then we have an adapted metabolic network which then can be used to calculate the regulation in the system by the differential Jacobian. We have applied this now to many different systems in uh, germplasm collections. Actually, I will focus, I will go more into detail on this in a minute. And we have also applied this to an overall scheme from farm to table to health. And indeed, we, we are investigating also nutritional aspects uh, uh, from germplasm collections um, and, uh, um, and um, investigating also, um, for instance, a natural product tr uh, treatment with natural products uh, and effects on diabetes, uh, um, immune system or cancer, for instance. And we use the same framework for this. And this is all embedded in a large international effort also with uh, colleagues of uh, many countries in the world. And we recently um, proposed also rapid delivery systems for future food security in this context. So I come now to the second part of my talk. Um, it's about now the uh, Panomix meat germplasm, the intraspecific crop, crop plant uh, um, variation. And maybe we can actually exploit this also for climate change mitigation. So the hypothesis is that agriculture can contribute to the mitigation of climate change due to its nature as a carbon sequestration process, due to photosynthesis and CO2 fixation. Um, the real world is different, unfortunately. So we have harsh climates and they reduce plant productivity leading to inefficient CO2 uh, fixation. Uh, we have a high demand of industrial nitrogen fertilizer for productivity. At the same time, a low nitrogen use efficiency by the plants due to losses from this fertilizer from the soil uh, due to nitrification processes and greenhouse gas emissions. And the whole food production, the industrial processes generate a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So there is a net greenhouse gas emission instead of sequestration. So it is obvious from all these uh, um, facts I, I presented to you that there must be a transformation of agriculture in the future. And this is a slide from the FAO. They, um, they really uh, suggest a significant transformation due to, these, uh, um, due to these observations which we see. And um, there are frameworks for this transition. So for instance, agroecology, it's a quite old topic, was coined in the 80s by Conway, for instance, and he, he, he uh, published a very nice paper on this, where he summarized the major topics of agroecosystems, productivity, stability, sustainability, and equability. So you see this goes long time back. Uh, and, and these are fundamental properties of any complex system and derived from system theory. And um, they, they, these topics are intimately bound to system theory and systems biology. The FAO adapted this framework and, and extended this with um, human social values, resilience, and synergies. And on the top, you have the genetic variation, which is very interesting. So it's about germplasm collections and germplasm genomics. And here, uh, a good framework is also the consultative group of international agricultural research. I don't have to explain it much. It's a non-profit network for plant research and breeding. And here we work closely together with um, an institute in, in India, Aikrisat Institute with Rajiv Varshney, and I will come to this back. So what are these institutes and, and all the research institutions are doing now? They sequence the germplasm collections. So they have assembled the largest germplasm collections in the world, thousands of wheat germplasm collections, chickpea, pearl millet, etc. And now we see this trend that every, every um, single uh, um, germplasm is whole genome sequenced. And this is, um, this actually, um, we have done this very early on in a large consortium, in Abudops Italiana Consortium, um, 1001 Genome Consortium. Abudops Italiana is the first fully sequenced uh, um, uh, plant species, higher plant species, and was uh, building a large foundation for uh, fundamental research in plant biology. 
And we have now um, more than 1,000 genomes fully available, and you, we have different ecotypes from all places in the in the in the in the world, from North Sweden to down of uh, down to south of Spain. And you can imagine that these ecotypes are really different in their adaptation processes. Now, once you have all this uh, polymorphism information, you can do genome-wide association studies and um, start to give interpretations of climate adaptation. We did the same with the ICUSAT Institute in Hyderabad on pearl millet. We uh, sequenced 1,000 uh, genotypes from pearl millet cultivars, but also uh, wild types from uh, um, um, uh, origins, original uh, habitats from Africa. And uh, we are also closely working together with Rajiv Vajne uh, on a Chikpi 3000 project. They recently published this Chikpi genetic variation map sequencing, uh, whole genome sequencing of 3,000 uh, and more uh, genomes. And we are working closely with them together on this. Because the main question is now, uh, once you have this genome information, can you actually predict everything what you want? This is, of course, the ultimate goal by, by sequencing, right? Can you predict metabolite dynamics, regulation growth, stress phenotype yield, adaptation to climate change? And we did a survey on this. So we uh, assembled um, many um, research paper on genome-wide association studies uh, on crop plants. And all together, we recognized that there is a coverage of the phenotypic variance and explanation of, uh, of traits in these studies of 10 to 40 percent. So somehow, the genome information alone is not sufficient to explain all the variance here. And how can we explain this? Because it's much more complicated, the situation. So we have the genome, which translates, transcribes and translates into a transcriptome, a proteome, post-translational modifications, then metabolome. You have all the interactions uh, in the network. And in the end, this generates the genotype phenotype equation. So, and this is covered by a panomics platform, uh, which I call it, I call it a panomics platform, where we really try to measure all these molecular interactions here. And in the end of the day, maybe uh, we can explain much more phenotypic variants from an, in this holistic uh, analysis. So in the last 20 years, we built up this panomics platform from next generation sequencing to proteomics, metabolomics, genome scale modeling. And this was all in, always embedded in this, in this theoretical approach of green systems biology. I want to focus today on metabolomics a bit. Metabolomics is the idea to really profile all um, small molecules in a tissue, and which gives you already a clue about biochemical regulation, as I showed you in the beginning. Um, we, we have started a Vienna Metabolomics Center at the University of Vienna, where I'm located in Austria. And this is an open research platform for national and international scientific collaborations. Um, so we provide uh, a full platform for profiling, GCMS, Alzheimer's, structure elucidation, databases, statistics, data integration and modeling, but also a platform for protein and fossil protein profiling. In the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, we had more than 120 publications, including very high impact papers on very nice uh, collaborations. And I'm happy to explain you more if you if you um, you can just contact me and can give you more feedback on this. So there's also a web page where you can inform yourself about this platform. We um, developed in in this framework. Um, okay, what is going on später? I hope you can see my presentation still. There was a, a, a window. Maybe. So we developed in this framework in, in multi-omics uh, um, extraction protocol where you can extract metabolites, proteins, uh, RNA, DNA, and any kind of other, even fossil proteins from one single sample sequentially. And this protocol works for plant microbes, environmental samples, human animal samples. We then uh, do a classical approach with GCMS, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and liquid chromatography and assemble this data for pattern recognition and biological interpretation. For this, we have developed a toolbox um, uh, which combines all these multi-domics, data integration, 
uh, statistical modeling, but also biomedical modeling and so forth. Um, and also a, a module on machine learning. So I'll give you now an example. I, uh, we worked with potato breeders in, um, in, in 2008 and we were asked whether we can provide them with robust biomarkers in the field, actually. Right? We developed all these methods in the lab, of course, uh, but uh, we integrated then protein metabolome analysis and machine learning techniques in the field for these potato breeders. We had a potato germplasm collection of 25 different uh, um, uh, cultivars. They were easy, um, very well characterized by the breeders. Um, and they were grown on different plots in different regions in Germany and we sampled hundreds and thousands of uh, tuber samples from these experiments. That time in 2008, you have to imagine there was no method actually where you could run such a high throughput project. So we had to develop new technologies, which we call mass accuracy precursor alignment. I will, I will skip the details on this, but this is a nice uh, method if you're interested in this. Then we could apply machine learning to, to, the, to the data and we did uh, altogether different methods in machine learning. We had 18,000 predictions and we, uh, with only a misclassification rate of 0.001, we classified all these potato tubers, their, their cultivars and their genotypes. Uh, actually, they were not sequenced that time, actually, which is interesting. Now they are sequenced. We can even do much more on this. And we identified very strong and robust biomarkers from this field trial for the breeders for different properties like black spot disease or chip quality. And the metabolite data were also used for machine learning and regression analysis. And here also we had a high accuracy prediction of chip quality and black, black spot disease susceptibility in these different cultivars. So now I come back a bit to um, uh, uh, fundamental research using Arbidopsis Tariana as a, as, a, um, as a model system and uh, here we investigated natural populations in their natural habitat. So we analyzed their metabolomics, uh, their metabolite profiles in situ in their natural habitats and we applied uh, modeling approaches. So we selected from this large panel of 1001 genomes three populations which we also contributed to this panel they were sequenced and we measured them in their natural habitat. We measured metabolites uh, and they were easily distinguishable uh, um, in, in these um, different habitats. And what was really interesting, we found strong GPS uh, metabolite correlations also in this data. So actually the metabolite phenotypes could predict the GPS coordinates. Um, as these um, populations were sequenced, we could also look for um, polymorphisms in this genome, whether they are different. So these three populations are different in their SNP enriched genes. And indeed, we found um, also here, uh, even though the populations were very close to, uh, to each other, we found here a very distinct uh, um, gen genotype or natural genetic variation. These are protein networks based on SNP enriched genes in these different populations, and they really uh, um, extract different uh, um, different um, dynamics in these uh, natural populations, which fit to the biochemical data which we generated. So we calculated their biochemical regulation by the Lyapunov equation. And these differences in the three populations also were correlated to the SNP enriched genes in the, in the genetic data. So this was a very nice um, observation here. We um, integrated this with multi-omics data also um, in Arbidopsis and further Arbidopsis Tiana populations. We installed data logger for to monitor microclimate uh, environment here. And all these multi-omics data from metabolites, proteins, and transcript had short, short strong correlations to the uh, environmental parameter like soil water content, uh, humidity, air temperature, uh, photosynthetic active radiation, and so forth. So there's, there's a clear correlation of the molecular parameter to this microclimate environment uh, data. We extended this then to metabolic genome-wide association studies. So now you can imagine if you do a full metabolite profiling of these germplasm collections, you can correlate them to the natural genetic variation as well. You do a genome-wide association studies, 
with the metabolites as a phenotype. And we did this with 250 natural accessions. They were grown in different uh, regimes, uh, 16 degree and 6 degree. And uh, we found um, immediately, we, we measured about 3,000 samples on this panel and we immediately um, di differentiated the uh, gr uh, growth conditions, cold and 16 degree. And we defined a metabolic distance to stress of stress adaptation. And this varied uh, dramatically in the ecotypes. So the metabolic phenotype showed a clear natural metabolic variation. And of course, we correlated this then to genome data. Um, and we did some Manhattan plots here also, and we identified strong, uh, uh, um, strong uh, gene marker, for instance, fumarase under cold conditions, which correlated well to this natural metabolic uh, variation. So allelic variation correlated very well with this metabolic prediction. So there was, um, once we published these things, there was a nice comment in the social media, every location and microhabitat creates a unique phenotype. This suggests that locally selected and developed cultivars may be superior to seed stocks produced and distributed globally. And this is something where we really can exploit in the future these germ plasma collections. I showed you where you have also the land races from the natural habitats uh, in uh, conjunction with the cultivars as well. So germplasm collections, of course, offer also the opportunity to uh, select for climate smart crops. And I have one example for this year. We investigated uh, four different genotypes for pearl millet and uh, compared this. We did a comparative approach to wheat. And we selected them from different regions in India, Iran and, and uh, UK. And we did a, um, a large proteomics profiling at, at the same time as a large physiological uh, uh, characterization of these genotypes. And in the first instance, what you see is that we measured root, leaf, and seed samples. We measured thousands of proteins, I think altogether 12,000 proteins. And the first thing you see that there are dramatic differences between the uh, genotypes. There were tolerant genotypes and susceptible genotypes. And in all these different categories, which you see here, you have really dramatic differences, especially once you put them under drought stress. And we measured also physiological data. Um, here uh, you see a visualization of these data, for instance, um, leaf photosensitive activity, seed weight, root lengths, um, regulation of stomata opening, regulation of light harvesting complex, and so forth. And you can visualize this with symbols, which depict the quantitative value of these parameters. This is a system by Odom. He, he invented this kind of visualization approach uh, to visual, visualize uh, multivariate data in a nice manner. And you look here and you immediately see uh, things, uh, things which are ongoing and happening. So if you look for wheat and pearl genotypes, you see they, they, they have completely different root morphology, for instance. They have different uh, yield also. Um, and if you put them now under stress, drought conditions, so the uh, sensitive um, uh, lines, they start to develop completely different root morphology, very pronounced in the sensitive pearl millet uh, genotype, but also in the, in the wheat genotype. Uh, the tolerant genotypes do not um, uh, develop this strong differences in root morphology. They do not do escape uh, from the drought stress, but they have other mechanisms that come to this. And based on this really um, detailed uh, physiological characterization, we are now able to correlate to do a linear regression to all these um, parameters for um, protein predictors. So we identified many proteins which were strong predictors for root physiology in pearl millet and wheat, uh, in uh, predictors for seed yield and pearl millet, predictors for seed yield and wheat. You can now extend this to any kind of a parameter, for instance, um, photosynthetic activity. But what was very interesting is that we saw a very strong uh, phenotype in the pearl millet tolerant line, a genotype here. You see, uh, if you look for the regulation of the light harvesting complex under stress, this is rather green here. It, it means the photosystem is maintained under drought stress in contrast to the other genotypes. So we identified a stay green phenotype here, which is uh, very interesting. And um, this phenotype under drought stress is able to maintain 
the photosystem and the photosynthetic apparatus. So uh, proteins, and I guess this is the first proteomic fingerprint of a state green phenotype here. Proteins of this uh, um, photosystem were maintained. At the same time, oxidative stress uh, um, was uh, lowered in contrast to the sensitive uh, um, line. And we can feed all this, of course, in, in, in a in a now in a in a workflow where we develop new elite lines when we can um, uh, look in detailed uh, um, mechanisms of this stay green phenotype. These are data which are not predictable from the genome, as I, as I said in the beginning. We also assembled all proteome markers under drought stress in important staple food crops like wheat, rice, barley, maize, and develop also a regulatory model on this if you are interested in this. Another approach which we are interested in is biological identification inhibition. This is due to um, the complexity of um, the plant soil microbiome owned interaction. So plants uh, have an intimate interaction with the soil, which is almost neglected nowadays, but the root exudase really controls the microbiome and the soil. And um, the, um, the loss of uh, nitrate from the soil is furthermore amplified by so-called nitrification processes. So you see the oxidation of ammonium um, to uh, nitrate um, lead, uh, leads to um, leaching of nitrate from the soil. The, the nitrific denitrification process then leads to greenhouse gas emissions. So this overall process is very uh, uh, um, uh, problematic. And uh, plants are able to release um, inhibit inhibitors like biological nitrification inhibitors, which can uh, inhibit this process and then um, uh, can generate more stable, balanced um, nitrogen fertilization in the in the in the agricultural system. We investigated this with pearl millet genotypes under drought stress. We applied our root exudate metabolomics platform. We identified hundreds of different metabolites, and we indeed also detected an increased um, biological identification activity in in the uh, in the sensitive line, which uh, also changed the activity of nitrification of of the organisms. And um, this um, this is something we can now apply in large germplasm collections. Um, there, there are also indications that um, wheat land races have biological nitrification inhibition capacity. So we can now apply our panomics platform to this approach and uh, try also to identify novel biological nitrification inhibition mechanisms to increase the nitrogen use efficiency and to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. And so we can actually address also this nitrogen fertilization process in sustainable agriculture. So in the last uh, uh, minutes, I, I present you some um, other aspects of the Panomix platform uh, resolution on sub-tissue and cellular level. In the framework of green systems biology, we proposed um, strategies for future breeding strategies. Um, first, we said combining genome selection with environment-dependent Panomix platform and deep learning platform would improve the prediction accuracy for market-dependent trade performance. This is something we are testing at the moment. Panomics resolution at the sub-tissue, cellular, and subcellular level provides information about fundamental functions of selected markers. And combining panomics with genome editing and speed breeding tools will, of course, accelerate to develop a large diversity, biodiversity of available uh, elite lines in the future. Um, we recently applied this to the wheat grain filling process. So we investigated um, uh, grain filling uh, during different time points of, of the development at 12 up to 26 uh, days after anthesis. And we selected different tissues to understand the whole overall process in the, in the wheat grain filling uh, um, during these stages of green, uh, grain filling. And we analyzed, again, thousands of proteins in the different tissues. They were nicely separated uh, on the different time points. Uh, we identified several very strong dynamics. For instance, in the seed code, we had a, um, in the later stages a strong uh, uh, upregulation of light reactions, but also uh, nitrogen assimilation. Um, 
where we can assign now really different protein functions to these different tissues depending on the on the developmental stage of the grain. And what was also interesting uh, that in the endosperm we saw an enrichment of transport, a cellular vesicle transport in the mid-grain uh, uh, um, mid grain filling stage, so uh, 15 days after anesthesis. And so we asked further questions, so we wanted to um, go more into detail on the cellular resolution. For this, we used a laser, laser micro dissection technology to sample specific cells from the alloyron, suballoyron and starchy endosperm cells and from the endosperm transfer cells. And based on this, we also had a nice separation on uh, thousands of proteins now in these different cell type uh, samples. Um, in the early stages, 15 days after anesthesia, they are well separated. In the later stages, interestingly, the suballoyron moves to the endo uh, to the starchy endosperm cells, so more more or less um, converts into this kind of cells, which makes also sense during the development into the mature form of the seed. And what we really, really interestingly, what we observed is that um, from the 15 days to the 26 days, we have a um, clear change in the supply of nutrients to the to the uh, grain and the embryo. So in the early stage filling, um, in, in the early stage of grain filling, we have almost uh, the transport by the uh, endosperm transfer cells into the endosperm uh, and starchy endosperm and, and also to the end, um, embryo. In the, in the late grain filling stage, this switches to a fully developed seed coat, which then starts to supply um, the, the starchy endosperm with nutrients, photoassimilates, but also amino acids. And so we measured also the cavity fluid uh, during the grain filling process. And this, uh, um, this um, is a very nice agreement with transporters we, we, we identified on the cellular level. So these are cell-specific transporters in the endosperm transfer cells and also in the starchy um, and, and um, coincides also with uh, proteins in the starchy endosperm cells. So here we have identified transporters on sucrose and glucose transport and they are more pronounced or more upregulated in the 15 days after anesthesia in the uh, rather mid-term grain filling stage and this coincides very well with invertases which also more upregulated in the 15 days after anesthesis and also um, uh, key enzymes in the starch biosynthesis pathway. So thank you very much for your attention. I come now to the conclusion. <coughs> so um, what we are investigating now <clears throat> that is, is that more than 60% of this plasticity I showed you, pleiotropic, effects, polygenic traits, physiology is not explained by genomics. And here we investigating, we adding now all the panomics platform data into this, into these tools for genomic prediction. And we hope that we can predict much more phenotypic variants here. What we also um, have seen that is that if you go to the to the habitat, to into the field and look for in situ molecular phenotype plasticity, this changes a, a view on the on the system also. And this gives us a new idea on the genotype environment, phenotype. The main point, it is possible. We can, we have shown that we can do these very complex multi-omics technologies in the field. And this will give us more information on stress adaptation mechanisms as well. And uh, our aim is also to apply this to germplasm collections, to crop plants, and but also to natural ecosystems, anthropogenic ecosystems here, to re reveal these different uh, adaptation strategies to correlate them uh, and predict them traits like yield, stress tolerance, morphology, and physiology. All this work is, of course, covered in an international network, and I'm so grateful for, uh, I just uh, mentioned two collaborators here, Rajiv Vashni from the Acrosat Institute. He's now in uh, Australia at the University of Murdoch University. He moved there. And uh, Dong Zhang uh, from the Nanjing Agricultural University. So. Uh, uh, we did this uh, wheat work together. I have to thank all my group members, of course, especially Palak Chaturvedi and Arindam Gattak, who provided most of the of the data I showed today also. And uh, in the end, a little advertise. 
um, we recently got funded um, uh, for a large PhD school on plant resilience in the climate crisis. We have lots of renowned uh, um, international institutes, the Gregor Mendel Institute, Max Perot's labs as, uh, um, as members in this network. And we have also a large phenotyping platform. So the main aim is to identify signaling cascades in crop plants. These protein kinases are typically the first contact point for a plant and the environment to the plant to trigger these uh, um, regulatory cascades. Uh, to improve then the plant performance, growth and yield, of course. If you're interested in this, we are, still have open PhD positions for this. Please send me uh, your application and I can give you more information on this. Okay, thanks a lot for your patience. I think this was quite a ride uh, um, with lots of data, but I'm looking forward to the discussion. And um, yeah, thanks again for your attention. Thank you very much, Wolfram, for a, a very enlightening talk that covers a lot of breadth and a lot of work that's been going on for, for many years. Um, so just a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A panel and we'll try to get to them. And even if we don't get to all of them today during the webinar, uh, Wolfram has agreed to respond uh, subsequently. So uh, we will get all the questions answered. Um, one of the first questions that came in is about cost, because what you're talking about is quite large and complex, and uh, which is my favorite topic. I love complexity. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, is it possible to study, or not just is it possible, well, what is the cost of studying the genetic variation at, a, at the genomic level for germplasm for an entire collection of a particular crop species when you're looking at both the intra and inter-species uh, specific variation existing. So what what how do, what does that run? What is the timing? Of, and of course, I guess it depends to a certain extent on how large is the collection that's engaged. Or... Right. Well, this is a crucial question, of course, right? I, um, uh, so what I showed these examples, um, interestingly, the, uh, this kind of rapid metabolite profiling is very cost efficient in the meantime, right? It gives you not all the information on the full metabolome, but it gives you a uh, very, very interesting information which you did not have before, right? But I think, yeah, I mean, uh, and then you actually, you, you have just a starting point. Yeah, now imagine you have all these different conditions then you have to profile a whole germplasm collections under different conditions. This amplifies the whole approach. So what I would say is that um, we have to establish um, consortia like metabolomics consortia, like uh, a genome uh, consortia, right? So, so I think the challenge and the demand is also very, very strong. It's comparable to the genome sequencing approaches in the 80s and the 90s, where many labs start to collaborate on this. And I think this this would be a, 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 um, a valuable way actually to, to, to start with this analysis. But I think it's absolutely necessary because uh, there's so much information. And of course, you can extend this also to quality of food crops. Yeah? It's not only about yield or so, but it's also about quality and health aspects. What are the aspects or what are the effects of these natural products which you take daily to, uh, to your body? What are the effects on your health? And this starts yeah. to be a big topic uh, uh, also and for this, you you have own you have to measure uh, the, the the compounds, the metabolic compounds, and therefore, yeah. Um, although it is on um, in comparison to uh, nowadays sequencing technologies, it's comparable, yeah, on the cost. Uh, I would, um, but but it is in the same range, so you 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 can estimate what kind of costs. Uh, you, you will have uh, in these projects then, right? Yeah, so one of, of course, one of the things that the, that we've been very interested in is trying to maintain quality of the sequences. And in some of the studies that you included, you're not just, you're not really looking at sequences at a certain quality level. Does that make a difference for what you're 
doing. Uh, it does for when we're trying to do comparative genomics because it's when you have differing quality of the sequence, uh, it makes a big difference in our understanding. So did that impact or did that impact you or did you just kind of go to the lowest common denominator and and look across uh, across the platform to study no absolutely absolutely the quality uh, uh, of the of the um, data is absolutely essential also right so uh, yeah. interestingly we have now really high quality genomes from Arabidopsis thaliana uh, right. we yeah. Right. <laughs> we start to have high quality from wheat genome data, right? We have high quality data from chickpea, for instance, and permalate, right? Um, but of course, um, I mean, I, you know this much better than me, right? So uh, it's a long way still to to uh, provide the necessary quality. But in the meantime, definitely we can do a lot, right? Um, I call this actually the different proteomes of the same organism, right? So when we started also work on, on a green algae, Chlamydomonas, and in, I think in 2008, there was the first release of the full genome. We did uh, yeah. lots of proteomic studies. And, yeah. and then there came, we had several um, upgrades, updates of the genome annotation, the functional annotation and so forth. In some of these annotations, you did not even find Rubisco enzyme, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine, right? And, yeah. and, uh, and and so we we use the same proteomics data set with the different annotations, right? And in principle, we got different proteomes for the same organism. And this makes no sense at all, yeah? yeah. Uh, because this is uh, uh, intimately bound. So you need a very good genome annotation, a prediction, gene prediction for a good proteomics analysis also, yeah? So this yeah. is directly bound to each other. And so, of course, there we rely completely on the quality, yeah, and um, yeah. yeah. Now we're uh, trying. We've got some funding already to do high quality, platinum quality uh, level sequencing of some land races that are that represent the breadth of diversity of the of the wheat uh, gene pool. Uh, but we're still trying to pull all that together. But for wheat, this is an expensive enterprise. This is not. Mm -hmm. Arabidopsis genomes, which you can <laughs> right. Yeah. I know it's heck. It's it's the polyploidy is is it's really a killer yeah. in this yeah. annotation, right? And it's, it's not really we... the polyploid; it's the size, you know, the sheer size of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and in the have... end, I think we would need some. Uh, what would be really very good is a chromosome resolved uh, annotation, right? So yeah, um... which is what we have. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. we. We uh, we did maintain that uh, requirement when we launched this project many years ago on trying to get the wheat genome reference for the wheat genome and of course chromosome quality was critical to this yeah. so um, and glad we didn't go the other way of, of ignoring the you know just right. the, you know from right because that was really critical to us as we've gone through and it's critical to breeders too it also is how breeders would actually integrate the resources. So, mm -hmm. so we do have uh, some other questions. I don't want to dominate too much, although I could quite easily. Um, what do you think about creating molecular gene sanctuaries for cultivated and wild species? And I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what that exactly what that. Uh, yeah, what, what is it? Yeah, right. I'm not. Well, so... I think it's the issue of if you find things in situ. Uh, yeah, in situ molecular gene sanctuary sanctuaries. Thank you, Vinod Kumar, for clarifying that question. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at things in situ, you're going into the field, which is what you're you're doing. You are can can we combine these molecular genes to build a sanctuary? I think that's the general gist of it. Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, so um, what I wanted to um, also um, clarify that a gene function needs to be uh, understood in a context of the environment. Uh, and uh, in the, 
I think uh, if we if we have if we define some gene functions in the lab, for instance, and we put the plants and out into the environment, these gene functions can somehow change or are in a different context, right? And this yeah. is something uh, we can learn from these in situ uh, measurements. Of course, we have the, the same genes, uh, but their dynamics are maybe uh, different, uh, if I understand this correctly. And then we can yeah. really learn learn from this, uh, um, right? Yeah. Well, that, that gets to one of the issues, the you know, of, of climate change and how we would integrate things based on the climate, because there is these environmental conditions that impact the phenotypes. So do you have, specific, if you're looking at wheat, do you have specific recommendations regarding that? I mean, are there ways that we should approach it? Well, um, so for me, um, the, the study I presented today was very, um, very mind opening. I think these stale green phenotypes, for instance, are really interesting uh, um, phenotypes for all aspects. So if, if the plant is really able to maintain the photosynthetic apparatus under severe stress, uh, it has all consequences on um, downstream levels of metabolism, especially ROS production, oxidative stress and so forth. So this was kind of mind opening for me to see the overall behavior of the stay green phenotype. I think there are some really interesting uh, um, future developments uh, for really building new varieties, although of course there are several uh, state green phenotypes available, right? Mm -hmm. But not maybe yeah. with the least consequence uh, to understand yeah. the full process. Yeah. Right. So, are you concerned at all that the initial reference genomes that are used might be introducing systematic bias into the proteome predictions? Yes. Yes. I as I as I explained a minute ago, right? Definitely. Um, we are also working on a, on, a, on a genome sequencing approach now for a tropical tree, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 we, yeah, this is actually it's the only country known country in the world. It's Clusia, and mm -hmm. and uh, and we see really um, how difficult it is to to have a good assembly and also a high quality. Uh, genome uh, after uh, with all this data we have partially 200 fold coverage of the genome it's a genome of about three gigabases but mm. it really it's it's a really a big workload mm. and and uh, it's absolutely depending everything downstream if you want depends on this quality uh, uh, genome yeah. Yeah. and Right. Yeah. So that's the way. I mean, my that's always been my view is that quality really does matter, and um, and it's you know of course influences your strategies on how you approach things as well. So I'm very you know I know I know we don't have much time left, but I'm very interested in in what you've done in two different areas. One on your uh, you know you're starting to incorporate microbial information, which of course has a huge impact, uh, particularly on nitrogen use efficiency as well as greenhouse gas, carbon sequestration, etc. How are you, uh, that's one aspect. The other one I'm very interested in is your sub-tissue and, and, and single cell work that you seem to be headed down. So what do you see based on, with those two things in mind, as well as what you've presented today, what is your, what perspective do you see going forward? Well, I think, um... There is this really uh, now we, we could not um, really foresee or expect this say ten years ago um, that we would have this um, uh, amount of data for germplasm whole genome sequence germplasm mm -hmm. connections. I think this is the biggest treasure we have at the moment. Actually, <laughs> I think for for human on Earth, I think it's the biggest treasure because these plants are our um, most important partners, right? Mm -hmm. And now we have the full genome sequence available for each of these land races, of these cultivars. Uh, we can breed different different types and go immediately to the full genome sequence. I think this is something, um, well, it's uh, really, I could not imagine 
uh, decades ago. And this is now what we what we can exploit with these technologies, right? And we yeah. can ask questions like if we do really um, systematic genome-wide association studies with different properties, right? For instance, with a with a root exudates, right? We we really systematically address um, the question. So now we have a very interesting phenotype secreting a strong BNI compound. So what what genes are involved in this process and so forth, right? So this is. I, I would say it's a revolution in biology at the moment, and we we, we simply have to follow up this this uh, approach. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you, and think that it's the natural step forward if we ever really want to to be able to one design specific varieties for specific conditions. Um, you know, not that we're not doing that now; we are, but it takes 15 years, 12 to 15 years. To do that so we need faster ways uh, in which to approach it so but, well thank you very much uh, Wolfram for your presentation uh, and for this discussion and I look forward to your future work and hope that you'll continue working in wheat um, we need uh, all the information we can get for for wheat as it is an extremely important crop and in my view the most important uh, crop that is produced. So, but thanks everyone for participating today. And again, just a reminder, uh, you this will be available on the um, YouTube channel that the IWGSC maintains. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. So thanks again. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.